Welcome to this week's episode of uh, tokenization, the reality of tokenization of private markets. And we have Sherry Noonan, who is the CEO of Rialto Markets. Uh, I'm Pat O'Meara, the chairman and CEO of Invenium. And with us, we also have Todd Stevens, who runs uh, Capital Markets for us. And so uh, we're, we're excited to have all of you with us today. And uh, Sherry, why don't we start with you? Give us a quick introduction of yourself and uh, and Rialto and, and, and what you do. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pat and Todd, for having me on today. I'm excited to, to have this conversation today. So I'm Sherry Noonan. I'm the CEO of Rialto Markets. Um, my background is really in capital markets, and we can get into some of the history of that. But I really grew up in the center of electronic trading in the U.S. equities market and all of that infrastructure that got built out over you know the 90s and 2000s. Um, and the 2016 roughly uh, moved into private markets, uh, founded Rialto Markets with a few co-founders, and we're focused on private markets and building out that technology and um, different components specific to the infrastructure that's required um, that never really had been built up in, in private markets and uh, really excited about where things have gone from then until now and the direction of travel in this space. And, and, and Sherry, just a quick follow on question before I go to Todd. Tell us about what Rialto does right now. Tell us about your business. What do you offer to clients and what's the role you play in the marketplace? Absolutely. So we are a FINRA member broker dealer. We also operate an alternative trading system in secondary markets. What's alive and we're doing today, day in and day out, is we facilitate primary issuance for single companies looking to raise via their community. We also operate marketplaces, so we provide the technology, regulatory infrastructure and operations for marketplaces that are both fractional marketplaces as well as marketplaces that are creating new and different products in private markets um, and in the digital security space. So that's what we do today and what we've got live today. What we're working on in the future is really a lot more in the institutional space, so working with funds, working on building out platforms um, with large institutions. Fantastic. We're so we're so pleased to have you on. Uh, you play a critical role in the the ecosystem that uh, tokenized private markets uh, demand. So thank you so much. And uh, Todd, uh, I think uh, a lot of these folks know you, but on a number of these calls, but why don't you reintroduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Pat. Thanks for having me. And Sherry, great to see you again. Um, yeah, I, I look after our capital markets, like Pat said, uh, at Avidium, but my, my career started back in, uh, in, in banking, investment banking, more on the sales and trading side, uh, mostly fixed income. But I was always in the capital markets and in the derivative markets. And then kind of like at the same time as Sherry, I moved over and, and got, a, got a taste of the private markets. I, I was looking after a, a group that kind of managed the intersection between the investment bank and a private bank. And one of our core products were private market assets. And, um, and I always had a... Uh, a keen eye for 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 these assets, um, and and I used to call them the hidden alpha machines because I mean that's where you could find a ton of alpha because people just wouldn't spend the time or the effort going through these. I mean you had to have uh, liquidity locked up, uh, you had you had to have um, the ability to weather kind of liquidity um, because because there w there wasn't any, um, and so so as I when I left banking and and I jumped into Pat's arms. Um, um, really, this is just the, the intersection of capital markets meets private markets, and we're really, really excited to help democratize these private markets. Um, and then what Sherry and her firm does is, uh, is, is a big catalyst for helping that, helping that kind of propel forward. So uh, excited to be here. Yeah, it, it, it really is. A, um, uh, when we think about the size of the markets, it's far and away the largest market in the world. Um, and the, the lack of liquidity, the lack of data, the lack of venues in which to buy um, uh, is, is uh, one of the reasons for this illiquidity. And, you know, we're all different members of the ecosystem. We're solving different portions of the problems uh, that are going to yield an outcome, which is liquidity, right? But you need the data, you need the venues, you need the regulatory interface, um, uh, kind of the storefront, so to speak, right? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that Sherry, you provide. And I want you to talk, let's let's go back a little bit, right? There, we, we find ourselves at a unique moment in the evolution of the of the markets and digital trading. But you've you've literally had a front row seat for multiple iterations of these digital markets uh, coming online. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about your career and and uh, how you 
uh, started look, at, you know, you know, participating in, and maybe not even a front row seat, maybe being on the court, right? Okay. Uh, as, as these these digital markets came online. No, it's been fascinating. I've been really fortunate in that in the '90s, I joined a company called Instanet, and Instanet was the you know first ECN, um, one of the largest ECNs, and then. Um, basically, it was started in 1969, which is crazy, but I, I joined in the 90s. Um, and it, there were several other alternative trading systems. Now they're called, but they were called ECNs back then, looking to build out the, the U.S. electronic market structure. Um, and, uh, you know, back then in the 90s, it wasn't really a foregone conclusion, which is which is really interesting. And by the early 2000s, so, so we built out a lot of different um, liquidity pools, different types of trading, different ways of interacting with the marketplace with different um, types of investors and different types of uh, traders. So um, by the early 2000s, then it became, you know, sort of uh, that we had crossed that chasm. And, you know, in the early 2000s, a lot of the large brokerages started buying electronic trading platforms that were already established, that already had the, the technology built out and that infrastructure and network built out. Um, so I left Instanet to go to Goldman Sachs, which had purchased Spearleads and Kellogg, um, a, another firm. They had a platform called Ready that was a, an electronic trading platform. Uh, my other co-founder left Instanet. We met, all three of us met at Instanet. The other co-founder, Joel, left Instanet to go to City. They had just purchased a platform called Lava. So it was early 2000s was really a period of consolidation. There was a lot of platforms that built up, then they got consolidated, they got purchased, and the large banks then acquired these capabilities. And um, it was soon after that, really the mid 2000s, that um, the concept of alternative trading systems um, started to develop within these firms. And, um, you know, importantly, late 90s, in the 90s, um, certain regulations helped facilitate this, like Reg NMS that, you know, really made the connectivity between all the different venues, making sure that when you were routing an order, you were routing it to the, you know, best venue at the best price. That helped with the, with the growth of this, um, you know, the electronification. Um, it, by you know mid 2000s, a lot of alternative trading systems started building up within the confines of these large brokerages because the large brokerages were really trying to pool as much liquidity as they could before sending it externally, and that was a real shift in terms of how they how they operated. Um, so pool as much internally, you know, be able to to cross as much internally, and then send it to the different venues where where it was um, you know going to be executed and uh, really evolved, you know, my career evolved with the, the market. So, you know, late 2000s, I went to Deutsche Bank um, as the, as the um, COO of electronic trading. And that was really um, to build out the institutional uh, portion of this marketplace and to, to be able to, to, you know, build out new and different types of pools creation of algorithms, creation of, you know, different types of trading modalities. By, you know, 2015, um, so between, you know, 2010, 2015, 16, I, I was the COO of electronic trading. I was the COO of um, global equity derivatives, a lot of model risk remediation work with regulators globally, and then um, the COO for global equity trading, so the entire franchise. And by this time, equities was pretty mature, right? There, there were the market structure was mature. Um, we can probably tell it was mature because Robinhood was, you know, starting to dabble in the zero um, commissions and E Trade, you know, soon followed. And so, um, the the economics and, and the maturity of the market really was played out. And so, that's when we turned and, and said, you know, what are some greenfield places that that we can look to? to take the knowledge that we've got and the experience that we've got in terms of building these, these platforms out and apply it to a new market. Um, you know, through the experience of not just the equities market, but we had built out solutions in swaps and foreign exchange and in, in, other, in other sectors, FX. Um, and so seeing the, the combination of all those different markets, as well as sort of seeing the global overlay, gave us a really good position to, to enter private markets and to look at, you know, where were the first product market fit um, might be. It, you know, and, and private markets covers just a whole lot of landscape. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and depending on the seat that you're in, uh, it, it's, it's very different, right? And um, 
uh, you know, uh, MakerDAO just was releasing some of their results, right, where a large percentage of their assets they considered real-world assets. And their, the biggest asset that they held in real-world assets were U.S. Treasuries, right, which other people who are going uh, – you know, reading the headline, you'd think that that was real estate or infrastructure or private equity, but they're saying, no, 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 it's not something digitally native like Bitcoin. Do you know what I mean? And right. so their treasury is is moving into other types of assets. And and um, so there's a lot of landscape covered when you say private markets, right? Give us, give us one minute on what is the private markets that you are focused on today and why did you pick that area? Sure. So um, I will, I'll talk about the first product market fit that we found. And that was really in the regulation A in crowdfunding space, single issuers, um, really looking to raise from the crowd from their community. And, and why we chose that was one, um, you know, the, the issuers didn't necessarily care about the technical back end and the fact that it was blockchain on, on the other side, they really just cared about, you know, how can I raise funds from, you know, a $10 million issuance from 20,000 investors efficiently and in a cost effective way. That, that's what they cared about. So it was it was not difficult. It, it was less difficult than sort of doing that long sales cycle with an institution that's going to take two years, might take three years and a lot of education. It was really more about the economics and, and the, the cost efficiency. Um, uh, it, and then from the investor side, really, it was about, you know, the investment. And, and so it wasn't challenging to get both parties to sort of adopt the, the model or adopt the technology. And that's why we that's why we chose it. It also allowed us to build out retail, um, you know, rails. So the ability to scale our, our technology that then we were able to leverage again when we started offering this as marketplaces all the way down to unaccredited investors, retail investors, and what do you need to do um, all the way down to that level? So efficient KYC AML onboarding, efficient payment rails, the ability to process and reconcile thousands and thousands of payments um, and, and have that really efficiently um, done. Reminded me a lot of the first market makers back in the equities market. You know, Why did they come out ahead? Why did Citadel come out ahead? It was because they could you know, look at 10 million transactions and find the one error in that huge in that huge pile of transactions and be able to, to rectify that quickly and that that efficiency around operations. So that's what we focused on first. And that provided the springboard. Then once we had done, you know, dozens and dozens of those marketplaces started you know, asking us and, and we started getting vetted by some of the professional services groups. And, and that's when we really were able to go into the marketplace side of things. You know, this, Todd, uh, this gets directly to your career, right? Where you, you know, you, you, you know, were running structuring for Deutsche Bank and Europe and America, and you left and you, you, you were overseeing this, this group that had the intera interaction between the private bankers and their clients didn't want the private bankers calling them. And they wanted to talk to the invest, the, in the investment bankers and the investment bankers didn't want to talk to the the family office guys, do you know what I mean? The really individuals, do you know what I mean? And you played that middle role and got everybody to play nicely in the sandbox. And I may be telling the story incorrectly, but you really were looking at people who made fortunes in the private markets and giving them public market like uh, investment banking and advice that they weren't traditionally getting. And, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, how you were seeing that inside your role at Deutsche Bank. Yeah, so so I mean, the big family offices, the 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 big wealth vehicles, they want access to in interesting private market opportunities. Typically, companies, or it could be real estate, or it could be infrastructure, or whatnot. Um, and and typically, what they got service with from their from their from their wealth manager was was just the KKR forty fifth fund of the year, and um and and they they love KKR nothing great against manager forty fifth fund KKR no, nothing against that I mean I think they're, they're right. wonderful but they want a little diversity so everything is, uh, is maybe a little more Neapolitan than just vanilla and so so they were really interested and I mean that made me start thinking that there is a path to 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 getting some more liquidity in these assets and and really if you look at the exact same private market asset as a public market asset there's like a yield cliff 
between the two. And, um, and, and again, the components of that are um, liquidity. I mean, like, like you said, Pat, the outcome will be liquidity, but then there's also a data element in there as well. So, so you have, you have, you have, you have a, a dearth of data and you have no liquidity, and, and, and how do you chip away at that? And, and, and that's where uh, I think us as a community, um, and Sherry helped spearhead part of it, um, where we're going to make some, some strides, whether it's better data, the path towards more liquidity, bringing the ecosystem together, and, um, and really it's, it's that democratization of, of, of of alpha and uh, to, to more people because um, because there is a ton of alpha in these assets. It's just we just got to try to unlock it. And um, I think um, the other thing I'd, I'd say is that um, we're, we're in a, we're in a sector which which has regulatory tailwinds. I mean, most of the people in digital asset world, more crypto side, there's regulatory headwinds every single day. People get smacked. And here, like where Sherry was talking about the Reg A plus Reg C F, those all came out of the Jobs Act. Uh, I think 2012. The, the government and the U.S. at least is pushing this, and they, and they want to get uh, kind of more of these assets into the hands of of of, uh, of people less than accredited investors, more mass affluent and whatnot. So they see this as as a great thing. So so it's going to come. There's a win, not if. I mean, the government is behind it, and um, again, we're just playing a, a, a big evangelist role, and and, and um, like it's going to be here before we know it. And and it really is. The government is behind and the regulators are behind macro trends, but they're not necessarily able to discern well, and there's a historical fact pattern of this, is they want the incumbents to pick it up, but the incumbents don't. And so they, they, they don't understand how do we do this and all these new people come up and ECNs, there was a very famous lawsuit, right, that really cleared the way for ECNs, and I think that probably changed your life. Am I right on that one, Jerry? That's right. And, and and when when these lawsuits come and there's a little bit of clarity that comes, all of a sudden the ECNs go and, and rule NMS. You know, I, I talk about this as somebody who was outside looking in. You were there, but there were two main players who were the dominant players, right, in that space. And then everybody else kind of interconnected and shared data and traded back and forth, et cetera. And you kind of, I would say six or seven people shared uh, 80 per, or 20 percent, and then those other two had had the 80 percent. Well, when rule NMS came, those two big ones had no ability to interconnect with anybody, and they ended up, you know, being the losers. And those ones that had the interconnectivity won. And 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 I view this a little bit as kind of the Web three fully decentralized reality. If we're not creating an ecosystem and interconnectivity and just trying to build a single silo or pool of capital, we're going to lose. And 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 I guess what I'd like to do is just from your standpoint, talk about rule NMS. What did that do? You know the, these regulatory changes, and then and and then let's talk about the regulatory uh, environment that you're finding yourself in right now. And and some of it's a tailwind, some of it's a swirl, some of <laughs> I wish that I had, you know, a, a clear breeze like I see in some other location. But let's start with NMS and then talk about what you see right now. Yeah, and maybe I'll go all the way back. So if we go all the way back, you know, the the 60s, 70s, 80s, right? How did you how did you you know buy IBM? You would call your broker, right? And and you know before you'd call your broker, you'd call IBM and actually get an annual report mailed to you. Um, you you'd read the annual report. You'd say, yeah, this looks like a good company. You call your broker, the broker would call the exchange, the exchange would, you know, go buy the 100 shares or whatever it was. And the average cost was roughly um, from from studies we've, we've read or roughly around fifteen hundred dollars to, to execute that trade. Not great, pretty expensive. So, you know, it really limited, you know, who could participate and how they could participate and what kind of size you could participate in. And then you fast forward a little bit more and you've got, um, you know, the, the beginnings of some of the online things in, in the 80s and the 90s. And um, so, you know, now maybe you're emailing your broker or maybe, you know, the, the broker's emailing the exchange. So you get the cost down to roughly, you know, $500 and it's a couple days, three to five days. Um, you know, fast forward a little bit more, the introduction of market makers or not even market makers, but some of the high frequency trading that firms that came out that had, um, you know, algorithms around their trading. Now you're getting the cost down to, you know, and you've got different venues. So this is probably in the 2000s. 
um, you know, that, that trade's costing you maybe $25. So you've got a huge cost savings, but you're still paying $25 to, to transact. And then by, you know, the mid 2000s, um, late, you know, 20, 2010, 2012, um, that cost is completely compressed because of the way the market structure has, has um, sorted itself out. Everything's electronic. You're sending the, the order on your E-Trade account. You're getting an automatic, um, you know, uh, automatic execution. The, the time horizon around um, the, the actual settlement has compressed and, you know, you're, you're not really paying for that now it's not free. Um, always someone's making money somewhere in the in the process. However, I would argue, you know, spreads have compressed, the, the time has compressed. And so that's the evolution of, of the equities market. And, and there's some interesting things about that. The availability of real time data, right? Now you go into E-Trade, everything's integrated. You can look at that annual report right on E-Trade. It's all integrated. You can see a bunch of metrics. You can even see different ratings agencies and sort of what their, you know, what their view is on this. Whereas 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had to really go out and, and find that data offline. It's now all integrated in, um, you know, and, and with the, the regulatory um, framework, really what Reg NMS um, allowed for is it allowed for, you know, it, it said, you know, there, was, there had to be certain connectivity um, around best bid and best offer, and it, it leveled the playing field and it helped venues um, create their own niches. And I think the same thing is going to happen around private markets. So for example, I was at Instanet, we were really geared towards institutions. That's, it was, it was for complex orders and institutional trading. Um, there was another company, Island, that they um, were really geared towards day traders. So quick in and out, quick in and out, simple order types. Our, our ATS was more complex order types and, and big order flow and, you know, being able to not show your whole hand, but, but go out with different slices of that larger order. So there were different venues really coming up and, and um, but geared towards specific specific areas of the market. And I think this is really important because we're at such a, a early stage in the development and evolution of private markets that, you know, I think as we evolve, there will be more than one venue that's guaranteed. Um, and there will be um, different venues that focus on different things and have different capabilities. And, and we need to have those evolve and really partner and, and bring, a, a, you know, bring the components like the data, like, you know, different components within the overall value chain to these segments of the market. And, and we really focus on use cases. So, so we try and, you know, we'll, when someone comes to us and has a use case to build something out, that's when we start developing because I feel like that has a better um, chance of getting the product market fit right um, as we evolve. Yeah, the, you guys have done a great job. And, and, and Todd, I, I'm gonna throw it to you on, on this for a minute, right? W Sherry and the role that she's playing um, in bringing liquidity uh, on a primary basis, right? Secondary is coming, that's down the road, but on a primary basis for private companies gaining access to investors, you know, this is this is a new iteration. When we think about not just equity of corporations, but we think about real estate and we think about infrastructure and we think about funds, right? And um, it, whether it's private credits, private equity, whatever it might be, um, I want I want to talk for a, a little bit about um, your own history and your own experience and how big is the data, the real time pricing but then also markets to go to to list as it relates to accounting treatment, the ability to get, uh, you know, to borrow against those types of assets. What, what are the ripple effects that we're going to see coming from price and venue, right? Well, how is that going to kind of roll through capital markets broadly in all of these areas? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And, and I just, I mean, think about something topical. Like, I mean, the Fed's raised rates to by 525 points, basis points since uh, no, the last 17 months, let's call it. Um, that, 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 that's tight for people. Um, how great would it be if you could just get some leverage on your private market asset if there was a, uh, maybe even it's a 20 LTV? Who cares? I mean, at least you, if you know the V, you, you can get that 20 LTV and get your private bank to lend you a little on that. Right now, people are having to 
do that through their home equity line of credit. And that puts pressure in different parts of the market. But I mean, this is really balances out kind of like the, uh, um, the, the market's a little bit better. And I, I truly think if when we get this right, um, we're going to we're going to take a little bit of the top and a little bit of the tail off uh, the business cycles a little bit because because you're going to have mechanisms that we just don't aren't fully rel relying on what the Fed does on that on that kind of like that last vote and whatnot. And, and then like are they they're trying to play kind of um kind of um kind of a god to everyone but like i i think if we if we can give people other choices on how to monetize and manage their portfolios you will see more people going to more liquid assets because in times of stress and whatnot you might not get the best prices the v might not be great and but but the l is at least there the loan's there to get that loan to value so so i i think i think there's there's tremendous amount of good that that will happen um and again like what will allow this lending to happen or liquidity to happen well like the banks probably or the non-bank lenders are going to have to have access to data on a more regular basis and once they see that and they get comfortable with that their their lending officers and whatnot they'll be able to risk manage that better because because it's it's all a risk management game and um and it's not the banks don't want to lend it's just they don't want to lose money when they lend because uh, their upside is a couple points and their downside's 100 points. So, so again, if we could just help them um, and get them more access to data around these assets, and and this is that virtuous cycle that we're going to create. And um, and um, again, and it's a win, not an if. It, you know, and and when we when we talk about this, kind of, there's two 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 parts to this next piece that I'd like to to throw out is number one. Um, when we talk about these uh, the loans to value and we talk about um, the data, you need the provenance. You need to see the origin of that data. You need to see how that data was processed through calculation tools and then delivered so that you can see the, see the basis of it. Right now you go on to Yahoo Finance, right? Or your whatever it is that you're using as your, your go-to on a personal basis or your Bloomberg machine or your... Uh, you know, fidelity account and you're pulling all this data down, you're seeing data that if it's materially uh, incorrect, there's jail time, there's real teeth, okay? there's an Edgar database. So you need a mechanism to trace all the way back and say, how can I prove the source of this data? And that's where blockchain comes in. And, and sh uh, Sherry, what you talked about with the trading, you were talking about um, the fact that it's on uh, the blockchain and that it's digital, it really doesn't matter. And, you know, we are 27 minutes into this and we have not yet mentioned the word blockchain. We've been talking about outcomes and results and benefits to the market that are sitting on top of blockchain uh, native solutions. Right. And what I want to kind of point to is, is we're, we're seeing real benefit coming into the market right, where, where you're able to deliver liquidity to a company that wants to raise money in a Reg A, a Reg CF, a Reg A plus, whatever it might be. And they're not caring what the rails are, they're caring about the outcome, right? You, you're seeing a company, they wanna get a, a faster mark, they want real-time access to data, they wanna be able to validate the data, what does that do? And we're talking about a tip of a spear right now that in my view, we're, we're seeing some use cases for private market assets but if we really kind of look forward two, three years, what does this mean, right? What does it mean when we have private market data globally that is available, available where people are gonna be able to seek alpha in new geographies, in new sectors, because they have better data and then they have better venues to shop for these assets where those people are, these companies are able to take themselves to a market directly instead of having to use the traditional incumbent conduits. Talk to us a little bit about how you help companies own their own ecosystem, you know what I mean? And own their own community. And, and, and then where is this gonna go, right? When we take, we, we kind of follow this logical conclusion of growth that you've been on for the last six years, you know, where is this going to take the markets? Absolutely. So a lot of the companies that we work with really are focused on building out their communities. It's sort of this shift in mindset from, you know, really um, including or, or going out and getting um, external capital, okay. whether that be venture or other types of capital, really focus on building and nurturing a community of people that are 
interested in, you know, whether it's your sector, whether it's electric, you know, vehicles, clean energy, um, but but rallying that community around um, making a change and, and voting with their feet and, and actually investing in, in this enterprise in the future. And so it's a really fascinating for me um, evolution of, of just investment um, in how these companies are unlocking a very different and un non-traditional source of, of capital to, to then grow and power their companies. And, you know, where we see this really playing out is, you know, these companies are, are doing it because they're, they're um, able to increase the breadth of, of investors that can, can, um, can invest in their, in their company, because just from an economics perspective, if you think back to the days where you would get, you know, mailed proxies or mailed annual reports to mail it out to 30,000 people, it just wouldn't make any economic sense. Now you can electronically distribute required information and other things to that massive um, network. Where we see it really playing out now is being able to use blockchain. Yep. I, want, I want to make a comment here before you go to this next point. Mm -hmm. What you just said, I think, is super important. Um, there's a lot of people who are creating tokens in order to technically um, achieve an outcome, but they don't understand the functions needed to go alongside the digital function in order to achieve that liquidity and distribution. Do you know what I mean? And I think one of the things that's really been a success for Rialto is you understand that the technology sits within a series of functions. Do you know what I mean? That need to happen in developing the community, selling the, you know, selling the security itself, right? Where you need people, where the company, where you're coaching them on how do you raise the money? What does that mean? How do you communicate this? And it's not just a magic event where I, all of a sudden I've got, I've traded my cow for the three magic beans, right? And now here, the, 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 the bean stock is going to go up, but rather this technology is going to allow you to perform certain functions faster, broader, better, but you still have to perform those functions, right? That's exactly right. And we, we are always saying, you know, it's not really about the, the tokenization or the digitization. Um, you know, what people are investing in is the investment is, is the underlying, you know, security. So if you're, if you're trying to sell magic beans, you know, it, it, that's a hard sale, whether you're traditional or digital, right? That's, that's just going to be a hard sale. Yeah. So, so focus on the underlying investment and, and what you're actually selling and what we're really providing is just a different way. You know, you're either people who are, who are working with us or utilizing our technology are either trying to increase the breadth of who they're going after all the way down to retail, or they're trying to create a new product like with the carbon product, you know, it, you know, wrapping a product into a, into a digital, um, really a portfolio of securities and then being able to offer that out to um, a customer base. Um, so, so you're usually you're trying to do one or the other, but inherent in that is, um, all of these other layers around data, around, you know, being able to have that woven in, we just don't discuss that component of it, right? Yeah, and, and talk, talk to me about your going into where this is going, right? You, mm -hmm. That's where I, when I interrupted you. Um, you. There's thousands of people making, uh, in, in you know, investments in your, your technology allows you to, in, you know, manage that on behalf of companies who are raising capital. Talk to us about a ticket size, right? What is your <laughs> ticket size that, that you see um, and the differences between some companies, what is a high and what is a low? Um, and and what, are, what does it mean when you see different ticket sizes and size of community? But then take us with that lens, where does this go? Absolutely. So, so an average ticket size is a roughly around $500. So very different. Right. When you think about when you think about, um, you know, private markets and minimums of a million <laughs> investments. So so we're talking about five hundred dollars and the SEC has done a good job with the Jobs Act of sort of providing a framework to allow retail investors to invest in these without betting sort of the farm on any one private company. So there are some guidelines around how much you can invest, given your net worth, given your income. So so there's suitability around that, which I think is really, really important. Um, that's the average ticket size that we see today. Where we're going, you know, some of the marketplaces that we've launched, 
Um, some of them are retail facing, some of them are institutional facing. So for example, one of the institutional facing um, markets, the, the ticket size is more like a million dollars, right? $5 million. So, so it's a very different shape um, in terms of what we see incoming. For those that are um, retail focused, what, what we see evolving is, you know, people looking past the sort of traditional 60-40 portfolio and saying, okay, maybe, you know, I, I need to still have this allocation to stocks and bonds, but increasingly, because there's such a divide between the public markets and private markets, you know, four or five years ago, people didn't even know about the private markets. You, you, you know, maybe you were able to invest in a fund somewhere, but likely the majority of people aren't. So how do I want to take that 10, 15, 20% of my private slice and allocate that up? Do I want to invest in individual companies? Do I want to invest in fractional art or cars or, you know, real estate? Or do I want to, to go into some type of fund that has been able to bring, you know, bring itself down to not the $10 million minimum, but a $5,000 minimum. And so I think that's where we're going with this. And then as people are investing in these things, they're going to need to see the information on a more regular basis, not annually, you know, not quarterly, but they're going to need to see it to, to be able to manage their overall portfolio and exposure. And talk about breadth, not just individually, but kind of ge geography, jurisdiction, market segment. Um, and, and Todd, I, I think I'd, I'd like to turn this over to you kind of to teep Sherry's response, right? Where are we going to see this tomorrow versus where Sherry is today and her typical customer? Right. What are, you know, because the hot dot is private credit and these funds. Right. Uh, you know, the banks, uh, you know, the cost of capital has gone up dramatically. Right. Um, and, and the the ability to access that is changing. Private credit is the hot dot for a reason because they have cash and they're distributing it. You know what I mean? And they're getting those yields. Um, and it, 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 there is a lot of money going into this. Uh, there's a lot of money going into, I was talking to the CIO of a top 10 pension uh, the just past week. Uh, they, are, they are significantly allocating into fixed income. And they said the next decade is the fixed income decade for us. And, um, and, and you know, you look at this and say, what are the, what are the geographies, jurisdictions, asset classes, Todd, that this is going to come to where this benefit's going to play out? So, so I think the, I mean, I'm going to take it in a, in a slightly nuanced direction because I'm, I, I think your entrepreneur of the future doesn't have to be as much of a banker than he does as a community builder and a product builder. And when Sherry's mentioned the community, so important, like, like, um, but, but back in even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to get access to capital markets, like, it was it was an invitation only club. I mean, and like, and that, that wasn't your community that you're you're you're, they're, they're, you're raising your 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 kind of like bond out of. Um, that was Goldman's or Barclays or J.P. Morgan's community because because like you were you were minted and said you know what they've got trust and and we're J.P. Morgan we've given you trust where we trust this group and they're the great issuer and and go on and so so the beauty is is we've been able to take that down uh, away from kind of like joining the club of capital markets to joining kind of like each entrepreneur can take it himself and build a community and and raise offerings around kind of like um, maybe his purpose or I mean obviously he's going to have to have um, kind of um, revenues and, and, and returns and, and, and whatnot but um but I think I think you'll you'll find this coming to a, a much it's going to put the uh, a capital s in SME and maybe it's an SSME because it's small and smaller than middle size enterprises because because I, I think you, you're going to see a lot more of this and and I, I've frankly I've been surprised you we haven't the the, the kind of the, the the CF and the A plus stuff hasn't really exploded. We will have that explosion moment at some point because because I, I think um, it, it's kind of an education thing. It takes a while to get known and and I mean and, and really in 2012 when it came out to 2020, interest rates were zero. Money was kind of easy, not hard. Now it's a little bit harder, and and people are, are kind of getting educated on on the ways to to maneuver. And so uh, I, I think Sherry's business will will, will start will, will continue to boom because. 
these these are people will try to access it and then i think they'll there will be a a bunch of uh people were buying kind of um getting some good opportunities out there they'd be buying dimes for nickels and there yeah there's a corpus of success stories before yep. they were just outliers this one did this but for every one that worked there were 30 that didn't you know what i mean and and okay we got but the corpus of actual successes is growing and and part of that goes to sherry your own client selection right you know what i mean getting smarter about which clients are going to work and which were not and talk to us a little bit about this who raises money how are they raising money tell us a little bit about kind of the facts on the ground who are the winners that use you and who are the ones that get the the real benefit and then the next thing that i want us to hit kind of as the three of us is once they've succeeded and they've got some cash and their asset is on a platform like Invenium and they're informing it repeatedly and that middle office uh, reporting function is there and it's digital. What does this mean when you connect into a series of ATSs globally? Do you know what I mean? And all of a sudden that network grows, but let's say who is the success is and then what happens when you connect and that, and you have the ability to take that broad. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've seen lots of different success stories. So, you know, certainly companies that, that spend, um, you know, money and time on uh, cultivating their community are the ones that have been the most successful. And usually in sectors that are, you know, either more easily understood uh, or, um, you know, interesting for a variety of reasons, whether that be consumer products or um, you know the electric vehicles, clean um, you know clean energy, or um, those areas that have just like a very very um, solid base, like space technology. So space technology is one where you know it's people are seeing um, you know there's a limited amount of public investment that's a that you know can take place. You've got like the four billionaires, and then there's a there's a group of really interested um, individuals who are who have an interest in moving. The, the needle on on via private investment. So those are the companies that we really see that are successful. Certainly, there are kind of table stakes in terms of you know these raises where you have to really lean into um, you know investing in marketing, investing in building your community. And so those are things that you just you need to do if you're going to have a successful raise. Um, where we see this going is is um, really companies doing several raises about 30 percent of our issuers do multiple raises with us so they sort of you know finalize a raise meet a milestone do another raise finalize that raise meet a milestone do the next raise so it's it's very interesting it's it's shifting from you know series a through n to you know just another block of of capital right um and so that's that's another interesting trend that we're definitely seeing out there where we see it really going, and this depends on, you know, how, as we know, the cost of being a public company is growing and growing. So where we see this going is, is potentially companies just remaining private and providing that monetization capability to their shareholders via, you know, an alternative trading system or via, you know, one of these ATSs. And importantly, you know, where we're seeing interest is not just in the U.S., like you mentioned, investors globally are looking to come in and they can come in. Um, we need to make sure we're honoring the investor protections of the home country. But as long as we do that, they can come in and you can kind of connect globally to other platforms whether those be, um, you know, other exchanges globally or MTFs or, you know, um, so so there are a variety of platforms that can be connected in as we get to that stage of evolution in the market. Yeah, you guys are just doing such great work. I, I want to throw this out to, to everybody on, on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat uh, and, and we'll get to them uh, uh, right now. But, but I... I I'm a, I'm a buyer of this segment of corporations, private corporations having access and having a vehicle and a mechanism to raise money in a more efficient manner on a broader basis. Um, and, uh, you know, the, Todd, Todd made a comment that there's a tipping point coming. I, I'd love to hear your view or your prognosis on when is that other than tomorrow? Right, you know, because it's immediate, right? Maybe even this afternoon, right? The tipping point's gonna. 
But when when is that tipping point happening, and what are going to be the 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 elemental uh, components that create the the environment for that to happen? Yeah, Todd, did you want to mention something? Yeah, no, I, I'm not, I can take the first stab at that because I, I think the point of um, people staying private longer. Um, I think that's really fundamental and, and, and like people used to say that was a bad thing, but like, I mean, top tick, there was over 8,000 public companies in the U.S. Now there's less than 5,000. There's a reason for that. People can stay private longer. The cost of being public, really high. The liability of being public, even higher. Um, so so with, with mechanisms like this enable you to stay public and stay funded, um, yeah, I, I think this will continue to grow. And, and then people will just get better at, at kind of managing their community, managing their raises, um, kind of graduating from CFs to A plus to, to reg Ds and then, and then kind of, uh, and then, then kind of, uh, then choosing their own path. Um, so, so I think, um, I, I think there's, there's, uh, there, there's plenty of, plenty of room there for, uh, for people to stay public forever. Um, and, and not, not be on that, that quarterly kind of like grind, um, and um, but yeah, yeah. So and and I'll just add a little bit to that because as you were speaking, I was really thinking about you know back when when public equities were going through this transition to electronic, you know we would come up against a lot of institutional resistance and and the story went something like this: as things become electronic, my commissions compress, and and I make less money, and that was always the argument to to sort of push back against moving things into electronic infrastructure. And yes, we saw that. It used to be, you know, a nickel to to, you know, transact a, a share. And now that's that's dramatically, dramatically reduced. Um, but what's happened is the volume exploded, right? The volume exploded for a couple of different reasons. And notably, there was the introductions of products like ETFs that before being on electronic infrastructure, you weren't able to have, you know, ETFs in, in meaningful size because you couldn't handle that creation redemption process on an analog basis. So I just want to bring this back to private markets. While you know people might be nervous about moving this infrastructure electronically or or saying you know well I, I've got a really good position here because it's very opaque and it's very you know nebulous and and that allows me to to make increased margins. I think it's a foregone conclusion that this is going to move into electronic infrastructure. Um, the reason I believe it's in the next, you know, call it 24 to 36 months is because we're, we're now having institutional conversations. We're now having conversations with the incumbents, large financial institutions, large private equity funds. We're working with them on, you know, products and deploying those products to the market. And to me, that is a really telling sign about the maturity of, of the marketplace. And I might add something there. So, I mean, so, so these incumbents are, are coming in and it's like, like people like KKR and Apollo and Blackstone, they know where every family office lives and, and where all the, where all the big um, pensions, endowments, foundations, big asset allocators are. What they don't have is, is, is that mass affluent up to the, the kind of the, 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 towards that, towards the family office. And then, and they would love to get that. And this is a mechanism for them to get that, get to those people. And that's why I think it's, um, it, it's, it's going to be kind of um, a, a kind of um, a, that, that could be a catalyst that, that could help the ATSs take off. But uh, and, and, I'm sorry. I was, I was going to, I was actually going to ask the moderator a question as well. Can, are we allowed to do that? Yeah. I yeah. think so. So, so again, there's less than two dozen, ATSs that have digital security capabilities. Maybe it's 12, maybe it's 15. Um, but in a year's time or two years time, do we have more? I mean, obviously the, the regulators are handing these things out like candy. Um, so there's been a reluctance and then, or might there be less? And if there's less, um, is that because people are coming in and consolidating or lo love to hear both of your views on that? Yeah. So I, so I'm going to give a first cut at that, right? And then Sherry, you you answer that. Um, you know, when when commissions, you know, I, I think about two pivotal moments in the markets. One is when commissions um, uh, were removed, right? The 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 and um, the regulated uh, commissions were removed, and all of a sudden you had Schwab offering discount commissions, right? And that led to 
massive exponential growth in trading, exponential growth in trading, right? And firms were going under in T plus three, you had to settle your books. There were numerous uh, firms that were three weeks out of date and, and, and they'd never been out of date in their history and they couldn't close their books. And they just said, we're, we're processing more paper than we know how. They were throwing bodies at it. They couldn't do it, but they didn't have the processes to get it done. And the reality is, um, you know, Pierce Fenner, uh, I can't believe I can't, I'm not remembering this, Pierce Fenner Smith, uh, whatever, Merrill Lynch, um, <laughs> their broker dealer, right? And, 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 and also, um, uh, uh, um, gosh, I, cities um, that was Travelers, uh, primary broker dealer, had great systems, and they grew because they could handle the growth, okay. right? In the, in the trading, and I'm sorry that the the answer gets a little blurry when I'm my memory is not getting me the names anymore. And but I look at this and I say we're seeing all of this. Um, increased volume that is going to blow through people who have old or no tech stacks who are doing one trade at a time and their ats license is the only thing they're relying on you know what i mean and and building infrastructure to do that i, I want to say the second one was if you remember when we went from um decimalization right i worked on a trading floor when decimalization happened and i had a really good argument on why it was bad for the markets but what it was really bad for was my comp structure right, right. And, and and when we see this volumes just go through the roof so the infrastructure who's going to be able to do it who's going to be able to handle it who's going to be interconnected who's going to be able to share data who's going to have institutional capability and one of the things that we see is people like coinbase who are a new and we can talk Robin Hood. They have a new community that they can talk to. They've curated it. They've built it because that community that was the place the people could find it for a long time, right? And so they've developed and they're an alternative. And now Coinbase to be the next J.P. Morgan. Do you know what I mean? They're mer they're they're morphing into real world assets. Coinbase asset management has been set up. They're going into eleven jurisdictions around the world. You look at all this kind of stuff and you say, "Oh wow, they're taking this really key strength and they own a community and now they're selling other products into it, and they've got the infrastructure that can handle it." So the question is not just of the twelve to fifteen ATSs, of those twelve to fifteen ATSs, who has the infrastructure? to actually process trades and share data, right? And this yeah. is where Sherry, your own history and your own career as a COO, and you understand the operations because it's not just building it and getting it started, it's yeah. operating it and scaling it, right? And and I, I, I don't mean to, to take us down maybe a different path than Todd intended, but I think this is gonna be a huge issue because we know when we go out Right now, and, and I'm going to say one more thing, Sarah. I was about to pass to you. The, the, we, we're looking at some people who are building the coin base of, of, of kind of the developing world, right? And they're, you know, they're putting together a big investment package. They're getting everything ready. They're going to they're gonna do a big trade. And you look at this and you say, these guys are building a reach for a new definition of a bank that is going to serve a large portion of the world's population without a single physical storefront, not, not a single one. And they're going to offer them financial service products that they don't have. And in this type of innovation, feeding into regulated marketplaces where people are going to go there and then see product from all over the world. So when you have that point of contact that gets you into a network, that's huge. Mm -hmm. But then go into that point of contact and it can actually process the trades and handle the volume. Sure, those. I well, so I just would like to, I'd like to expand on that because I think it's critical for understanding how this is going to evolve. So if you think about, you know, um, building a network and who the, the competitive landscape, what the competitive landscape looks like, you know, 10 years ago, you look at that competitive landscape and it would be the large financial banks or large financial institutions would say, okay, my competitive landscape looks like, you know, investment bank A through N of the bulge bracket or of the large institutions. 
And now, you know, these these large financial institutions are looking around and saying, sure, they, they still exist, but really I have to expand the scope to include Coinbase, to include Google, to include Apple, to include all of these different companies that have built massive um, networks of communities that now can can easily not easily, but that can now expand that reach and expand you know what they're offering. And so I think it's fascinating, you know, um, what Coinbase and, and Apple are doing in the financial services sector because I really do think there's something there and saying, okay, Coinbase, you've got you know these millions and millions of U.S. investors. How are you going to? add to your platform, add to your distribution capabilities to retain and grow that user base apart from everything you're doing in Bitcoin. Apart from that, what else can you offer them that that really um, creates a very sticky environment? Hey, Sherry, and I'm going to give two examples of this, right? You, You have these large pensions that are managing for defined contribution. Uh, or for defined benefit. And they've got portfolios where they're running this in-house. They're doing it better than they can with a fund manager who's charging them fees that are meaningful. And they're saying, no, I'm going to take this in-house, right? As they begin doing that and using this new technology, they can begin, begin to unitize this and start to offer their own product into defined contribution that they're overseeing as well, but they're being forced to put in funds with daily pricing and, you know, AVMs, you know, uh, off of an AVM and a quarterly third-party mark or maybe even monthly, suddenly they have the ability to do this. And we're going to see massive change, not only in the end LP, using this technology to push in and expand their capabilities, but also when you have funds who are not black, Stone and, and, and KKR, um, you know, and, and Carlisle, the biggest of the big. But when you go and you have number, not one through 30, but you have number 31 through 500 who are known in one vertical, and but they don't have the ability to sell into a Morgan Stanley into a new vertical because they're not known for that and they're just rejected, et cetera. Those people are now saying, I'm going to own and build my own community so I can go and leap from number 500 to number five. And the only way that I'm going to do that is digital distribution, owning my own community, and uh, and my community who's watching my success in one area will allow me to go into another area. Does that make sense? That's and, exactly and- right. And and we're also going to see the at the at the end at the other end of the scale, individuals becoming you know being able to personalize their portfolio more. We're going to see everyone's talking about this massive wealth transfer that's happening. You know, getting set to to happen. I think you know as that wealth transfer occurs, the people inheriting that wealth are, are going to manage it differently. They're they're going to be looking to um, do something different. It's not going to be your grandfather's, you know, uh, way of way of investing. And and so that's why I think a lot of institutions are starting to engage and say, we need to get in front of this. We need to get prepared for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, Todd, we we have about two minutes left, and I'm going to give you and then Sherry kind of the final two words. Todd, as we talk about broker dealers and ATSs and the future of tokenized private market assets, uh, give us your final word, brother. Yeah, so I think um, the only thing that's pretty certain in my mind is um, costs are going to go down. I mean, right now, I mean, all these ATSs, sorry, Jerry and the other ones, but they, they have a rack rate that that price will come down. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like equities trading. It'll go to zero or towards zero, it'll trend towards zero. So that'll come down. Um, and really, the tipping point might be several years out. But I mean, it's when like the new generation of buyers can buy this stuff on their phone. They can self-custody it and maybe even use it to buy their Starbucks cappuccino. And there'll be some liquidity where you recycle through that that asset. It'll go to a trading venue, and um, and so th- when there's real liquidity, um, that's when this thing will just take off. And um, but um, again, several years. Yeah, and from my perspective, I'm I'm really excited to kind of watch this evolution or be involved in this evolution. But I do think it's it's a few years out, and we're going to see you know an increase in in both the participants 
nationally and globally, as well as, you know, the products that can be, that are being created. And, and I think that's what gets really interesting to really expand that, um, that net in terms of what you consider private markets um, into, into new and really interesting areas. What, what a pleasure having you on. You're doing great work in the marketplace. We're so pleased to be uh, in any way associated and affiliated with the great work you do. So Sherry, keep it up. Thanks for all you're doing for the, the capital markets evolving. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoy um, connecting with you guys. Thanks. Bye-bye.